So today, Intel launches their brand new 10th gen Intel Core CPUs. And while some of you will argue about how new some of the technology really is, the reality is that there will be new CPUs to buy with more cores and higher clock speeds, and therefore there will be new choices to be made if you're looking to build a new PC. Now, there will be a lot of videos going live today talking about these CPUs in great detail, but I'm not gonna do that now. In this video, I just want to answer one very simple question, and that is, how does Intel's new Core i9-10900K, which is a 10-core CPU, compare to the similarly priced 12-core Ryzen 9 3900X in pure gaming? When the first generation of Ryzen CPUs launched in 2017, AMD really made huge steps in CPU performance, but Intel was still considered to be a better choice for gaming as they had a clear single-core performance lead. But with the third generation of Ryzen that came out last year, AMD crushed it and pretty much closed that gap. However, Intel claims now that these new CPUs will be the ultimate gaming processor, so naturally, I wanted to see how true that actually is. Let's go! This video is brought to you by Corsair and their K95 RGB Platinum XT mechanical keyboard. The new K95 features a beautiful aluminum design, cherry MX switches, dedicated media buttons with an extra row for dedicated macro keys, extra durable PBT caps and a very comfortable and soft wrist rest. Check it out using the links in the description below. There are two reasons why I mostly want to focus on gaming today. Now the first one is the fact that while I know a lot of you want a powerful PC that can handle any task out there, many of you just spend most of your time gaming. And the second is that Intel is very clearly stating that these new CPUs are primarily made for gaming with almost all of their marketing being focused entirely on that topic. Now, I don't think pushing single core performance is an excuse to not talk about the fantastic multi-core performance AMD has to offer, but more like a huge compliment in some weird way because the fact that Intel isn't talking about it means that they know AMD does it better and they're not even gonna try to fight it but they are putting all their effort into this one battle that they might win. To make this as fair as possible, I built two very comparable high-end test rigs with these two CPUs. For the Intel rig, I went with the MSI Meg Z490 Godlike, and yes, you will need a new 400 series motherboard for these new CPUs. Now, this board is completely an overkill, but it's also insanely cool. It has great VRM design with 16 and 90 amp power stages. There's an OLED display. It has dual Thunderbolt ports and 10 gig LAN, a ton of RGB and five M.2 slots thanks to this little expander you get. It is an expensive high-end board, so at least Intel cannot say I was holding their CPU back. I have 16 gigs of RAM here. This is Corsair's 3600 MHz Dominator Platinum RGB memory. I have a fast Samsung 970 EVO Plus NVMe SSD, NZXT Kraken Z623 to cool down the CPU, and a nice 850 watt Seasonic Prime power supply to power it all. Of course, the AMD Ryzen 9 gets uh, just as much love with the equally crazy X570 Aura 6 Stream motherboard, with an equally overkill VRM design, and also the only X570 motherboard to be completely passively cooled. I use the exact same Corsair memory, an equally fast Corsair MP510 NVMe SSD, a Kraken X52 for cooling, and another 850 watt Seasonic Prime power supply. I installed a brand new Windows 10 on both with all the latest drivers and patches, and of course, all games were tested with the exact same graphics card on both rigs, which is the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti Gaming X Trio from MSI. Both CPUs were tested in their stock configuration, so there is no multi-core enhancement, but they are using their own boost features. So there is a Precision Boost for AMD and Turbo Boost 3.0 for Intel. While both CPUs can be overclocked, uh, results uh, will vary from sample to sample. So if I start overclocking here, there won't be any guarantees that what you buy in a store will perform the same. So I didn't do any overclocking for these tests. Before diving into games, let's take a quick look at some standard tests to still get a rough idea of how they compare in pure CPU performance. We can see that Intel is a bit faster in single core benchmarks, as expected, but the two extra cores on the AMD lead to better results in multi-core benchmarks. 
Now, that doesn't really make a 10900K bad in other tasks. It'll still be more than fast enough for gamers who want to do some video editing or streaming on the side. I mean, I'm still editing all my videos using the uh, Intel Core i9-9900K. So, even though the fact is that AMD is performing better, I think it's fair to say that these 10 cores really shouldn't hold many of you back. But let's get on with gaming and you'll see that the results can really vary depending on the game you play and even more so on the resolution that you're playing on. In many games like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, for example, there is actually no real difference between the Intel and the AMD rig, even if you're gaming on 1080p. Strange Brigade is another interesting example where the frame rates are overall a lot higher, but again, with both systems being very close in performance. In most games, we do see Intel has a clear advantage, especially on 1080p. In F1 2019, we can see Intel a bit ahead on 1080p, with the gap disappearing on high resolution, and the same goes for heavier titles like Metro Exodus and Division 2. Now, in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the gap is even larger, and while previous differences you cannot really notice in real life, these are the ones that are actually noticeable while gaming. Far Cry 5 is an extreme example of that, and it just shows how much of an impact your CPU choice can have on a certain game. So the pattern is starting to become clear. Intel is typically faster in games, but it's mostly relevant on 1080p, with its lead shrinking heavily on 1440p and basically disappearing if you're gaming on 4K. That makes sense, as you kind of become more GPU bound and less CPU bound. And it also means that if you're using a weaker GPU than an RTX 2080 Ti I use here, the gap will shrink too. I didn't have time to test everything yet, but a quick look at some RTX 2060 Super benchmarks showed very little differences between them. Now, seeing that Intel's strength is in 1080p resolution and those CPU-bound scenarios, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper in what this could actually mean for competitive gamers. So, those of you on really fast 240Hz 1080p screens. And for this, I focused on three games, Overwatch, Modern Warfare, and CSGO. Now, there are no built-in benchmarks on anything, so I just played the same maps over and over again for a consistent result. Now, for Overwatch, I decided to leave it on Ultra, which uh, both CPUs managed to play at over 240 FPS average. And looking at the 1% lows, Intel showed a better result in every single run, with an average 20 FPS higher score there. 0.1% lows shows an even larger difference. Now, honestly, it's pretty hard to actually notice that while playing, but the result is there. Now, for Modern Warfare, I used a mix of some low, some medium, and some high settings for maximum visibility, and here we see a pretty similar result. Both CPUs handle the game perfectly well, but Intel does show a significantly better average and 1% lower result, but AMD showed a marginally better 0.1% low result. For CSGO, I went with high settings on Dust2, that uh, both CPUs can comfortably push at 240 FPS or higher. And again, Intel showed much better 1% lows here too, even though, again, you'll probably have a hard time actually telling the difference between the two. So, it's clear that if you just look at gaming and graphs, Intel puts on a very good show. But does that mean that the Ryzen 9 is bad for gaming? Absolutely not, the Ryzen 9 will play every single game comfortably and at high refresh rates and then especially well if you have a high resolution screen or a less than a top-end GPU. It also has a platform uh, that supports PCIe Gen 4 that Intel doesn't have yet, it has more cores that will clearly benefit you outside of gaming, and unlike this i9, you don't actually need a really good cooler to keep it cool. Even in stock configuration, this new i9 was hitting 70 to 75 degrees with one of the best all-in-one coolers on the market, so make sure you get something similar or at least a large tower cooler like a Noctua D15, for example. Now, AMD stays a bit cooler overall and will be completely fine with a mid-range air cooler. So make no mistake, Intel took a nice step forward with some more cores and again higher clock speeds, but they still have a very very serious competition out there. Now, this also doesn't mean that I will stop recommending the Ryzen 5 3600 for most gamers out there that just want a good 
all-around CPU that performs well, doesn't cost much and can be paired with some affordable motherboards as well. I'm going to test the new Intel Core i3 and i5s properly in the next few days that do sound very interesting on paper and I do hope that we will soon start seeing some affordable motherboards for Intel as well. But the fact remains the same. Intel claims a clear victory when it comes to pure gaming, especially if you're into competitive games and want to push those high frame rates on ultra fast monitors. If you're curious about something else, feel free to leave a question down below. We got a lot of testing done in the last few days and much of it didn't really make it into this video. And if you have any ideas for follow-ups or anything else, please just let me know. Now that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments down below what do you think about this new CPU and about this review. Don't forget to subscribe, give me a thumbs up and see you in the next one guys. Bye!